Good morning, everyone. I would like to start with a warmly uh, welcoming uh, Dr. Pascal Santimon and Mr. Amr Al Munayer, Dr. Ahmed Shawi. Here, this is a session that is very uh, exciting. As Mr. Omer said uh, earlier, Dr. Uh, Dr. Abla tricked me into handling a subject that is completely out of my depth. F <laughs> yani the, the only relationship I have with taxes is paying taxes. F <laughs> is I, I do pay taxes, yes. <laughs> I actually pay taxes, believe it or not. Uh, however, <laughs> however, Dr. Abla, I thank you very much Leenu, you gave me a, a very good opportunity to study, since I know nothing about uh, taxes, and especially international taxes, it was a good opportunity to uh, learn more. So over the past three or four days, uh, I had a quick primer on uh, taxes and international taxes. And um, let me uh, read you an article that was published in June of 2018 in the Irish Times as a primer for the discussion that we're going to have. Ireland is the biggest tax haven in the world used by multinationals to shelter profits, according to a new study by economists from the United States and Denmark. The research from academics at the University of California, Berkeley, and the University of Copenhagen estimates that foreign multinationals shifted 106 billion of corporate profits to Ireland in 2015. This was more than all of the islands of the Caribbean combined, 97 billion, and well ahead of Singapore, 70 billion, Switzerland, 58 billion, and Netherlands, 57 billion, according to the researchers. The Department of Finance in Ireland rejected the claim as overly optimistic, uh, simplistic, and rejected the notion that the Republic is a tax haven, saying Ireland is not a tax haven and does not meet any of the international standards for being considered such. The research paper estimates that $1.7 trillion of foreign profits were made by multinationals, primarily from the US in 2015, and that almost 40% of this total was shifted to tax havens. The research estimates that profit shifting by multinational costs tax authorities globally about $200 billion and reduces by 20% the taxes paid in the EU by multinationals. The OECD says Ireland does not meet the definition of a tax haven. OECD officials have said tax havens are countries with a zero tax rate, no transparency or exchange of information, and where multinationals have no real operations on the ground. With that article, <laughs> I'm setting the stage for an interesting discussion, I think. Um, now, in my uh, quest to learn more about uh, taxes, I came across some uh, topics that I think will be discussed, and uh, those topics relate to um, a concept that is called base erosion and profit shifting. باللغة العربية مبادرة مكافحة تآكل الوعاء الضريبي وتحويل الأرباح أو مكافحة تآكل القاعدة الضريبية ونقل الأرباح والسبجك طبعا مهم باعتبار أن احنا عندنا a number of multinationals شغالين في مصر وعندنا شركات بتكبر وتشتغل the other way around فالسبجك of transfer pricing is a very hot subject, very top, a very important subject. فخلينا بقى أعرف السادة المتحدثين والبانلستس ونبتدي بالبرزنتيشن. خليني أبتدي بمستر باسكال سانتومون Director uh, Center for Tax Policy and Administration at the OECD since February 2012. These are highlights. Um, uh, the, 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 the bios of each of the speakers are in the folder that has been distributed. So I'll just give some highlights, uh, uh, mostly about the recent uh, developments in the career of uh, individuals. Um, 
he's a French national, joined the OECD in September 2007 as head of the International Cooperation and Tax Competition Division in the CTPA. He played a key role in the advancement of the OECD tax transparency agenda in the context of the G20. In October 2009, he was appointed head of the Global Forum Division, created to service the Global Forum on Transparency and Exchange of Information for tax purposes, a program with the participation of over 100 countries. Um, Mr. Amr Munayir is uh, the former Vice Minister of Finance for Tax Policy. He served in this position from March 2016 until March 2018 with a mandate to reform the tax regime, develop an efficient tax policy framework, and monitor its implementation. Prior to joining the Egyptian Ministry of Finance, Amra had 25 years of solid experience in providing taxation and business advisory services to both local and multinational corporations throughout his career with the big four accounting firms. Amr led the tax consulting practice in Price Waterhouse Coopers, Egypt, including the international tax, uh, M&A, as well as the TP services. And we have with us uh, on the panel uh, Dr. Ahmed Chawi. Uh, Dr. Ahmed uh, is uh, the managing partner of the Mazars Egypt practice. He's directly involved in many of the audits and financial consulting engagements related to privatization undertaken by the firm. These include participating in the privatization of several companies under the engineering industry's holding company, directing the feasibility and marketing studies for the privatization of the television production studios and open air shooting facilities, and participating in the decision, uh, decisions on the sale of both the Pepsi Cola and Coca Cola bottling plants. He also serves on the General Assembly for the Food Industries Holding Company. Now, um, with this, uh, introduction, I will give the floor to uh, Mr. Pascal to give us his presentation, please. tax rules have been developed one century ago by the League of Nations to eliminate double taxation. And they've been so good at that that they have facilitated double non-taxation. They have been put at the test by globalization. The OECD, with the support of the G20, is trying to address that through the BEPS project, fighting base erosion and profit shifting. According to IMF, Egypt's international tax policy balances between offering an attractive environment to foreign investment and securing revenue by protecting the tax base against profit shifting and uh, tax avoidance. Uh, in several respects, Egypt's approach could serve as an example to other countries in the region.
we, we have the stars here, so uh, <laughs> we'll hear them live now. <laughs> Thank you very much. Good uh, morning or afternoon to you all. Uh, very happy to, to be here, very happy to be invited by this uh, prestigious uh, organization uh, to exchange with you on, on tax. Um, I, I, I'm pretty passionate about this topic, but, but nothing compared to the minister, obviously, so I, I try, you'll bear with me uh, through, through the presentation. Um, I, I've been invited to, to share with you what's the state of play of international tax. That sounds boring. And actually, it's, it's quite fascinating because we've been through a sea change over the past 10 years. Uh, and we are still uh, in the midst of, of fundamental um, changes. And what I would like to highlight as an introduction is that this topic, which used to be in the hands of technocrats, I'm a technocrat. When I started my career in the French Minister of Finance, I negotiated tax treaties. Nobody was interested in tax treaties except the president when doing a trip and say, I need to sign a number of treaties, why not a tax treaty? That was it. Since 2008 and the financial crisis, the landscape has completely changed and international tax has become the core issue of global governance, of global discussions. I must say, since 2011, I've been attending all the G20 finance ministers meeting and leaders summit. I'm in the room for each of them. And I can tell you that if there is one success story of the G20, one topic where the leaders wake up and, and don't read notes, but start talking with their heart and, and their mind, it's on tax. Quite fascinating that you would have President Obama, President uh, Macron, uh, President Putin, uh, just talking about international tax and, and with passion. And I think it tells a lot of what is at stake. The world has changed with the financial crisis, massively, deeply. What did the financial crisis bring? It actually brought a big concern related to the lack of regulation of globalization. We've had financial economic globalization through the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, and no regulation on the tax front. Why? because tax is at the core of sovereignty. Countries decide on their tax regime and it's a sovereign decision by the people. And consent to tax is one of the key elements of democracies, of the building of states, of modern states since the Middle Age. So countries are very keen on having their own sovereignty and they have done so. The only limitation was these technical tax treaties to eliminate double taxation. And as a result of that, in spite of globalization, countries have remained domestic. You had local tax sovereignties and global businesses. And because of all the gaps between these sovereignties, global taxpayers, high net worth individuals who are more and more exposed to international planning, multinational companies, and a number of them have bigger budget than, than a number of countries, they have been in a position to arbitrate, especially as globalization has meant that you had less regulation in the financial matters, less regulation on currency exchange control, etc., etc. And the financial crisis was the wake-up call for governments to realize that this lack of regulation, this lack of cooperation resulted in them actually losing out their sovereignty to tax havens, to small open economies which decided to make a business model out of that, like Ireland, like Cayman, like many others. Small open economy, no international regulation, I offer tax regimes which are favorable, and then country, ca companies decide where to locate their profits, or individuals decide where to hide their income and their assets. And the wake-up call was in 2008, with the collapse of Lehman Brothers and the G20 coming in. You have to be the firefighter, stop the crisis, and you meet and you look at global governance. You bring the G20 countries, they represent 85% of the world economy, and these guys have to look at that. And one of the topics they identified in November 2008 at the first meeting of the G20 was tax. 
One among others, financial regulation came first. And the OECD was very reactive there to propose an agenda. So that's the first fundamental reason why the environment has changed. The second, which I think is also relevant to Egypt, is the fact that countries, the international community, the UN have realized that aid is fine to help countries develop, but is not the magic recipe. Actually, the magic recipe may be about domestic resource mobilization. You need to collect taxes to fund your own developments. You can go for loans, but there are limits with how much money uh, you, can, you can borrow. So you can depend on aid, but in terms of accountability of governments to the people in some African countries, N N N Niger, in uh, Western Africa, you have, I think, 85% of the budget coming from Ed. How, how are you reliable to your people where actually it's other people's money that you spend? So the UN decided to make domestic resource mobilization the new big thing to fund development. So you have a convergence of interest there to put the emphasis on tax and the globalized environment. International tax is absolutely key to allow governments to make sure that what they decide domestically can be improved, it can be implemented properly, and that money is not shifted away from this sovereignty. So this agenda has developed with the support of the G20 under three pillars. And I'll go quickly through the three pillars because I think both three are relevant to Egypt. The first one started in 2008, 2009. That was the first way to tackle tax haven. What's the first element of a definition, and there is no great definition of a tax haven, but what is the first element? Lack of transparency, opacity. You can hide. You don't know who's the beneficial owner of an international business company in Panama, in the British Virgin Island, or anywhere else. You hide. Or you put your money in a bank account in Switzerland and the Swiss banker is mute, will never talk to anyone. And if he talks, by the way, he goes to jail. So no incentive to talk. This was the first attack on tax havens. The G20 told the OECD, actually the, the OECD had been telling the G7 and then the G20, you must do something. It's not ineluctable. We can put an end to bank secrecy in Switzerland. When I said that in 2009, people were smiling and Swiss bankers were insulting me. It's done. The G20 told tax haven, now you comply. No longer bank secrecy. You will cooperate. If non-residents come to your country, put money on a bank account, you will have to respond to the requests of the other countries to help them assess their taxes. And it took a blacklist in 2009, a, in the establishment of the Global Forum, peer reviews, to get where we are today. Where are we today? In 2019, we have 154 countries which have committed to exchange information on request, including Egypt. But it's not that countries are interested in the information of the money of their residents in Egypt. You're not a tax haven. I would not spontaneously go to Egypt to hide my money. But for you to get the information from other countries on the money that Egyptians may hide there. And if you want domestic resource mobilization, if you want a fair tax system so that it's not the people in the street paying the taxes for the people in, in, I mean, in Swiss bank accounts, um, you need to fix this. So for Egypt, it's an opportunity. It's not a constraint. There may be issues to deal with, but that's the main thing. Where are we today? 154 countries doing this. We have even 90, 90 countries moving further and doing automatic exchange of information. You don't even need to ask for the information. You receive it annually, automatically. A figure, fascinating, Switzerland, the heart of bank secrecy. In September 2018, first year of entry into force of exchange of information, automatic exchange of information, they have communicated to 70 countries, 2 million bank accounts. 2 million bank accounts. All the bank accounts owned by non-residents. Quite fascinating. You need to be aware of that change, because Egypt is, is, is a bit behind. You still have bank secrecy for domestic purposes. Your business for domestic purposes. For exchange of information with other countries, actually, you need to be part of the international community then. You've taken the commitment, so we hope that some progress can be made. The second pillar of the work 
has been, and sorry, I should have said on exchange of information, all the countries are doing, all the tax havens are doing it. And, and the one which was dragging its feet, which was Panama, actually in 2016, 2017, with all the G20, we did another blacklisting exercise to make a Panama understand. And Panama has understood, and now Panama is implementing. So all the countries have done. There is no single exception. In the region, Lebanon was a bit late. Lebanon has done it. UAE has done it. Everybody has done it. The second pillar of the G20 was about multinational companies, because indeed in 2010, 2011, we're proud to say, well, we've, we did fight tax havens. And then the journalists asked me, well, can you explain to me why there are two trillion US dollars of accumulated profit in Bermuda and in Cayman? You've put an end to tax haven? I mean, what a joke. And indeed, you had another aspect of the tax haven issue which is the ability of multinational companies to locate profits in jurisdictions where they don't have activities. They have a trustee, they have a shell company, and they have billions there. And the international tax rules allowed that, almost facilitated it. Why? Because in a global world, in a globalized economy, Bilateral treaties are fine, but actually you can go through a third country. To invest in Egypt from Germany, you will go via Mauritius. Because then you don't pay taxes in Germany, you don't pay taxes in Egypt, and you don't pay taxes in Mauritius. Better than paying taxes in Germany and in Egypt, even though you would have the elimination of double taxation. So, in a globalized environment, you need this form of regulation, which means fixing the existing rules, tax treaties, transfer pricing rules, which were initially designed back in the um, uh, 1920s to make sure that companies would pay their taxes where the value accrues, where the value is created. And when you have good lawyers, I suppose there are a number of good lawyers in the room, well, you pay the lawyer and you make sure that uh, through legal arrangements, the profit is shifted. And the rules had not changed to cope with these economic changes, with these legal changes. So we had a system where legally, it was extremely easy to shift the profit to a zero tax jurisdiction, or, and that's where Ireland plays in, you actually channel out of Europe or Egypt to Ireland, and Ireland had a good offer of hybrid mismatches, allowing the profit of an American company to shift to Bermuda, being untaxed in Egypt at source, untaxed in Ireland, untaxed in Bermuda, not repatriated in the US, which means that you had accumulation of profit in Bermuda and elsewhere. The system was broken. What we did in 2012 is we came up with this idea of BEPS. I was appointed director in January 2012, and I proposed to my secretary general to tackle this. And we actually were proactive. We told the G20, you know what, we've done the exchange of information thing, we need to tackle multinational companies. And why did the G20 say yes? Because it's a highly political issue. The people in the street who face increases in VAT, increases in personal income tax, they can see at the same time that the big guys don't pay their taxes, not because the parliaments would have decided so. That would be fine, that would be a policy. But because the rules were broken and because there was no international regulation. Why? Because countries say, we're sovereign. But uh, because you're sovereign, you're actually losing out your sovereignty to Ireland, which is engaged in very aggressive competition. So we proposed a plan to the G20 and what was instrumental there was to go fast. We did the plan in two years' time. The OECD usually were pretty good at taking 10 years to change a few commas and periods in long documents. And I told the G20, we'll deliver in two years' time. Everybody thought we were just crazy. We did it. At the end of 2015, we delivered 15 measures to make sure that we would realign the location of the profits of companies with the location of the activities. Not easy to do, because we had to cope with all the G20 countries, and you have divergent views from China, the US, India, the European, South Africa, and many others. But we managed to get there, and then we were told by the G20, this should actually be global. Let's invite developing countries to join in, and that's where we invited uh, Egypt to join the 
inclusive framework for BEPS implementation, which today has 129 countries on an equal footing, to implement these measures, to make sure that you can reach that goal of increasing the ratio of tax on GDP. Not that it's a goal to have high taxes, not at all. The tax system must, must be designed in a way which facilitates investment, facilitates growth, facilitates employment. But at some level, and there is no objective data here to decide which level, but for sure, 14%, you cannot fund development. You cannot offer tax certainty. You cannot offer an environment which is really conducive to investment because you need to build the infrastructure, you need to invest in the youth and in education, and that requires money. Clearly, 14% is one of the lowest in the world. You're not far from Guatemala, which is one of the worst on earth. And I, it, rem it reminds me of a trip to Guatemala at the time where they were not compliant. So I went there to tell them you need to comply with the standard. They had very strict bank secrecy and, and were a tax haven in Latin America. And uh, I arrived at the conference and two bodyguards bring me in an obscure room. I was a bit scared. And there was the vice president of the country telling me, please tell these people, the parliament and the other ministers, that you will blacklist us if we don't move. I said, beg your pardon, usually I'm not asked to blacklist countries. Do it, because in this country we don't have police. There are 140 murders a week. We cannot solve any because we don't have police, because we don't have tax. We must collect taxes. So we are really in that dimension which is extremely important. And the third pillar of the work of the G20 is related to that. We need to help developing countries, domestic resource mobilization. We now have a global village, which is the world. Everybody has to play with the same rules. And to play with the same rules, developing countries need to have their say in the development of the rules. The agenda I have described is about taxing countries versus tax havens. So it united all the taxing countries. Egypt is a taxing country. All the decisions which were taken are in favor of taxing countries and not in favor of tax havens, but they have unduly benefited from globalization, so now we need to level the playing field. But we had to make sure that all countries would come on an equal footing, and that's why we created this global forum and now this inclusive framework. Today, I have at the OECD 129 members working on BEPS on an equal footing. And this is extremely important. The IMF recently issued a paper highlighting the need for this equal footing for us, and this is what we are doing. And when we are interacting with Egypt and other countries, and we're extremely happy with the interaction with Egypt, which started with you, Amr, uh, and that we are now pursuing uh, with the minister and the whole government, is um, to assist you in the goal of increasing taxes in a way which is still favorable to growth and investment. So this idea of increasing the ratio as taxpayers, you may not like it, as citizens, as investors, as business people, you should love it because that will create the condition of a good uh, investment uh, environment. And, and there, there are a number of levers uh, um, of domestic policy and you go to that at the next session as well, but VAT is one of the important elements. And on the technical assistance, we have a team here, we interact, we have a tax inspectors without borders program to do APAs, advanced uh, pricing agreement, and so. Now, in a few words to conclude, I, I would like to try to sketch what's next. There's still a lot. And we thought that after BEPS, with BEPS implementation by 2020, we could move to other topics. Actually, we cannot. I can tell you that under the Japanese presidency of the G20, which is now, we were a few weeks ago with a minister at the uh, first meeting uh, of, of the G20 in Tokyo, and we will have another meeting in June in Fukuoka, and then the summit still in June in Osaka, where the leaders will be present. On the agenda of the Japanese presidency of the G20, tax features number one. Why? Because we today have another challenge ahead of us, which brings us probably to the last mile of the changes which are needed. It's tax and digital. The minister mentioned that earlier. How do you deal with Google and the likes? These companies are able to do massive business in a country that, without being physically present. 
while the international rules as designed one century ago are about you as a country can tax a company if it is physically present. But the digital companies, and more importantly, the digitalization of the economy means that more and more all companies, including traditional businesses, car manufacturers, or any other form of traditional business, they will be present in a, they, they will do business in a country without necessarily being present. If you do irrigation system manufactured in Germany, sold in Egypt, Yes, you will sold some real goods, but actually the value will be in the service provided in exchange of the data collected from the irrigation system. When do you start irrigating? That will be decided by the service provider in Germany based on the data. The service has a great value. There is no physical presence of the service provider. How do you deal with that? What is fascinating, and I will close with that, is that the US, which is not known today and I think it's politically correct to say it, it's the US is not known for being a big supporter of multilateralism, right? That's an understatement. The US on tax is exactly in the opposite situation. Who would have thought that Republicans in the US would love the BEPS agenda? The BEPS agenda is about, I mean, fixing the minimum, making sure that companies pay their taxes. The Republicans usually would not like this. What happened with the US tax reform at the end of 2017 is that the US implemented the BEPS agenda. They implemented all the BEPS measures. They slashed the rate from 35 to 21 and they implemented BEPS. You will tell me, so what? Well, so the US has changed its position. The Obama administration was pretty reluctant to do BEPS. They did it reluctantly. The Trump administration, that's a big paradox, is enthused with BEPS. Secretary Mnuchin at all G20 meetings say BEPS is great. I always check the translation, but now he says it. And then he adds, we need to go further. We need to move multilateral. We need to address the tax challenges of the digitalization of the economy. When this started with the Europeans or Egypt saying, we want to tax Google. And the Americans now, after Obama administration saying no way, the Trump administration say, yes, you're right. And not only Google, you need to tax Starbucks, you need to tax all the other companies, Amazon, but not only the digital, Starbucks, McDonald's, Nike, and the, and the rest. And we, the US, we want to tax Louis Vuitton and, and all the other companies doing business on our territory. So the US now is inviting the rest of the world to think of a multilateral solution to change transfer pricing rules because we didn't go as far as we should have on transfer pricing rules because the US was reluctant. Now that the US has enacted its tax reform, the US is saying we need to fix the system because we cannot protect our tax base with the existing transfer pricing rules even after BEPS. And we are in the midst, literally in the midst, today I have to clear a few documents which will go to the inclusive framework in the coming days, the inclusive framework meeting at the end of May, to address the tax challenges of the digitalization of the economy. And there is something quite interesting with an objective alliance between the US, China, India, developing economies saying we need to give more rights to tax to the market jurisdictions. We need to move away from the arm's length principle, which is kind of God on earth for tax people, and say, no, we need to depart from that, and we need to introduce some form of formula which will give rights to tax to the market, which will address the issue of Google and Facebook and the others. But we'll go beyond that for all types of businesses. And this is the discussion which is taking place, to which the European countries added, we also need to do what the US has done with its tax reform, fixing a floor to tax rates. There should be a minimum tax under which countries of residence of companies should be able to take the difference, and that's called guilty in the US tax reform. So we are today, after 10 years of fundamental changes, at the eve of another fundamental change, in an environment which is difficult, multilateralism is not at its best. The G20 is not, I mean, shining as, as it used to a few years ago. But there is a window of opportunity there with the US leading the charge, with the Europeans saying, yes, indeed, we want to tax digital companies, and with the OECD working 24-7 to try to deliver on this. 
and working with Egypt, which also has this agenda very high, as we heard uh, from the minister. Thank you. I'm beginning to like taxes. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for this uh, very elaborate coverage and uh, interesting uh, points that you've raised, especially on uh, digital economies and, uh, and digital uh, trade. Um, I think we'll have an opportunity to discuss some of these issues, but uh, let's uh, hear from uh, Mr. Amr al-Munayr first. <laughs> 